Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. We are back live for um, our third session of Transcending the Tribes, part of uh, Cambridge Muslim College Ramadan live sessions. Um, my apologies for the slight delay in, in, in beginning, but we are now live and um, uh, we will be starting the session. Um, uh, Alhamdulillah, um, what I'm going to do this time uh, again is to share uh, a brief presentation recapping the previous session and introducing the main uh, themes and topics for today and then I will go from there. Um, so uh, uh, let me just do that now, bring this up. So here we are, um, topic today is nurturing the new community in Medina. Um, so last time, um, just to go through the recap, uh, we talked about the du'a of prophets Ibrahim and Ismail, if you remember, uh, or you were there last time, um, making it a prayer for um, Allah to bring a messenger, um, uh, just upon completing the Kaaba, they made this prayer, and of course it was answered by Allah with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then we also talked about the, um, the wisdom in the Meccan Quranic code of morality and how these ethical qualities um, arose, um, uh, you know, in, in the Meccan revelation and how really in, in uh, the Meccan Quran, particularly in um, uh, Surah Al-Isra, there's this long list covering all the main uh, uh, ethical um, precepts of the community, along with some of the rationales and wisdoms behind them, the, the hikmah of these um, elements. And these are things we're going to see developing this week and next. And of course, um, we also I discussed about uh, prophets uh, Dawood, Suleiman, and stewardship of the earth. The idea of before even uh, the uh, Hijra to Medina and the forging of that community, there are um, stories told in, in the Quran of these previous prophets that wielded power and stewardship of uh, political con uh, control, but for the sake of, uh, of Allah, um, uh, with wisdom, and um, that these are being presented to the community, to the Prophet Muhammad in advance of um, his own, his own uh, time to take up that kind of um, uh, political role. And finally, uh, we discussed about different lessons um, to be learnt. Um, so um, uh, for today, um, I want to discuss with you the pledges of Aqaba. We'll come on to what those are and, and why they're important. Uh, the Pacts of Brotherhood, the Mu'akha, um, the Covenant of Medina and Justice for the Murdered in Medina, and, and how uh, the shift of, of the situation in Medina and the beginning of um, uh, the rules for Qisas in, in, in the Sharia, um, defense of the city of Medina, um, as well as internal um, law and order, there needs to be kind of some kind of external uh, defense of, of a city, of a community, um, from attackers or from oppressors, and uh, markets and fair trading, you know, how, how did the e economics go, particularly in the early days uh, after the Hijra, um, and lessons to be learned for today, again. So, inshallah, uh, hopefully this uh, uh, outline is clear. I'm going to um, uh, leave it on for a second just to let people who may be joining um, see what we're going to be doing today. Um, but in, in, very imminently, I'll be going to um, uh, pledges of Aqaba. Um, so this session, uh, just to recap on the whole um, purpose of, the, of these sessions, Transcending the Tribes is about this, it, it, it's a really focused attention on this um, significant um, moment and um, period um, for the founding of um, the Muslim community and for the Ummah as we know it, uh, for Islam, um, and particularly um, the, 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 the stages of ethical development that the community um, uh, un underwent in its time, um, uh, going from, you know, before the revelation of the Quran, the Meccan period last time, now into the Hijra and the Medinan period, and finally in the last session, the um, uh, uh, fully to the Medinan period. So um, I'm going to uh, stop sharing the screen and just, um, um, bring you um, up to the uh, uh, up to speed with what we're doing today. So the um, uh, pledges of Aqaba, um, these are two main pledges that were given by members of the um, 
the Arabians from Yathrib, which was the name for Medina. Um, pledges given to the um, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu at the yearly Hajj. The Hajj, as, as I'm sure you know, was a time when the different Arabian tribes would gather um, to, um, uh, to do the pilgrimage. Um, and um, that would give the opportunity for the, you know, for the um, sharing of, of, of news and of contact, of actually trading uh, would also happen after the, the Hajj uh, rites. But it would give a, a chance for any sort of political organization or um, uh, uh, messaging it would be very, it'd be a very um, good time for these kind of things to take place. And so what happened is that um, uh, one year before the Hijra, um, uh, so one year before the Hijri, um, uh, calendar uh, is dated, um, but actually 621 um, in the in the in the CE C -E, in the, in the uh, common era. Um, uh, you have mainly the, the, some members of the Khazraj, um, but also a few of the Alps. These are the two main tribes of um, Yathrib. Um, they came to the Prophet uh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Aqaba, and they um, made a pledge. Um, and um, this pledge later became known as the Pledge of, of Women, Bayas of Nisa. The reason for this is that um, uh, it, it, it's, it was when the second, the second pledge, which we're going to come on to, which is known as uh, Bayat of Harb, the Pledge of War, when this was made, um, this first pledge, um, which didn't involve fighting, remained the standard pledge for, um, that would be uh, still taken by women. And actually, you get a very good sense of this pledge um, if you go to um, uh, the 60th uh, surah um, and um, you um, look at uh, verse 12 um, in the Quran, you will see um, uh, that this pledge involves no shirk, no theft, no fornication, no killing children, no slander and no disobedience in good. And if you think about um, you know, these, these are some of the main prohibitions that uh, affect um, uh, you know the, the Muslim, you know the members of the Muslim community must have these red lines. Um, you know, there's also also murder as well would be would be included in that. But these, in this particular pledge, these are the ones that are mentioned. Um, uh, so it's, it's no shirk, no no associating partners with with Allah, no theft, no fornication, no uh, infanticide, no slander, and no disobedience in, in good. And then what happens is the next year. Um, uh, many of um, uh, the um, Al uh, these members of the Alson Khazraj return, um, and I think some some more come as well. And um, uh, so this is six twenty two. They make this second bayah in Aqaba. Aqaba is an area uh, near to the Mecca, where you know near 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 to where the Hajj um, takes place. And um, the pledge of war um, is really this promise to protect the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and this is what gives the security for the Hijra to go ahead. And it's at this point following this event that Allah gives the permission for the Hijra to be engaged. So um, I wanna talk about some of the significance of this in the, in the context of our theme, which is this transcending the tribes. What does this mean for the Aus and Khazraj? These are two warring clans um, uh, in, based in, in, in um, uh, uh, Yathrib. What does it mean for them to come to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And what does it mean for him to um, uh, take these pledges from them and then move the community of believers that has been living in Mecca for, you know, 13 years by this point um, to uh, Medina? Um, so what we can see is that um, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam shifts from uh, Mecca to Medina, he is going to start taking on this role as, of a political leader. He's um, uh, in Mecca. He fulfills this role um, as a prophet. But he's always um, w working under the political security of the existing tribal system. If you think about it, he's always, um, for most of the time, he's under the kind of protection in a political sense in a, in a, in a, in a, in, a, in, in the community from Abu Talib, his uncle. And um, uh, then later, when Abu Talib dies, which is in the same year as Khadija, this year of grief, radiallahu um, uh, anha, um, then um, he goes to seek help from Paif, very famously. And he, and, he, and he does not receive the help he wants. And this is what precipitates um, this um, uh, the hijra, the, the shift to the hijra. Um, in the previous Meccan, in the whole Meccan period, when the persecution is very bad, um, the Quran talks about patience. Allah tells the community to be, to be patient. When the situation gets very uh, severe, certain members of the community uh, emigrate on the first hijra, which is to Abyssinia, 
and they seek that political protection from the leader there, um, Najashi there. Um, so what um, Aqaba really signals is a new political basis for the community, one in which you have on the one hand, you have the, uh, uh, the what's known what's going to be known as the Muhajirun, right? These are the people who are making the Hijra from Mecca, and the Ansar. And actually, both these groups, the Muhajir, Muhajirin or Muhajirun and the Ansar, uh, which is the Ansar means the helpers, um, uh, uh, they both are actually, um, we could say, transcending the, the normal tribal s structures and, and organization to this new basis uh, of understanding, um, uh, which is uh, uh, formed on their faith commitment to, the, to Islam, to the Prophet Um because the Muhajirun, although the majority of the Muhajirun will be from the Quraysh, firstly, the Quraysh consisted of many different clans, which themselves could often be, uh, you know, in battle and you know, in 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 conflict. Even if ultimately they would uh, be, you know, go go together as one for, for larger threats, as we discussed in the first section. But also, there are um, members of other tribes that will be part of the Muhajirun. So, for example, the very famous uh, companion, Abdullah bin Mas'ud, he um, uh, is from um, the uh, Hudayl. It's a, uh, you know, it's a not, not the, uh, the Quraysh at all. And yet he is a member of the Muhajirun because he's from that initial community of believers. So the, the, the distinction between Muhajirun and Ansar um, is actually um, one of um, time, of chronology. It's about who is it the earliest community that were believed in the Prophet before the Hijra. And the Ansar, although the Ansar is majority, majority the Aus and Khazraj, the Ansar you know, will also include other members that then later um, um, can, uh, you know, can, you know, even if they're from a different clan or tribe, and then they come to Medina and join, they can you know, form, uh, 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 or they can attach themselves to the community. I think the, the, the strongest Ansar were those that initially helped, but there's the potential, they certainly would not be uh, from the original uh, Muhajirun and Al Awalun, the first Muhajirun, they could be considered perhaps later Muhajirun if they came later, or you know potentially part of the Ansar. But you see this um, this distinction here: Muhajirun and Ansar, and both are um, from these uh, you know multiple tribes. Now, this is again, this is not to say that these tribes uh, are wiped out, and that there is no such thing now as 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 Quraysh as Aus, as Khazraj, that's completely not the case. And you can see even after the, the passing of the Prophet um, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and the, you know, the, the subsequent leaders would come from various different uh, clans and tribes, um, the, 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 the Khulafa and so on. So, this, so you know, uh, and you know, the Umayyads, I mean, Ban, the Banu Umayyah is, is very much a, a, a pre-Islamic, um, uh, uh, you know, a clan that, you know, from that particular family of, of Umayyah. Um, so it's not the case that these things are wiped out, but they are subsumed within this larger understanding, uh, which is actually more important. And you'll never see, um, um, you'll never see in the Quran when, 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 when Allah is calling to certain qualities, to ethics, to, you know, to these elements, you'll never see a call towards these tribal units to the Aus, to the Khazraj, never. You will always see mention of the Ansar, mention of the Mahajirun. Um, Quraysh is a special case, of course, because um, such a you know the prophet's own Sarsam's own tribe, but you won't you won't see um, the the revelation coming down in these terms. Even if, in practical sense, you know, Islam did not try to completely rearrange the the, the realities of these family based structures. They were uh, that was a very practical and pragmatic uh, approach, I think, to uh, in, in you know um, you know f seen through the revelation. So so how is the uh, the Prophet some, you know, we, we're not going to go through the details of the Hijra per se, but the Prophet makes the Hijra and he's in Medina. Um, how is he going to bring together the Muhajirun and the Ansar? You know, th it would be unthinkable before Islam that the Quraysh would just be, um, you know, uh, uh, working in the same kind of community as the uh, uh, the uh, the Banu Qayla, Banu Qayla, Aus and Khazraj. This is, they're just completely different tribes. You know, they would have not, they would not have anything in common in the previous structure of Arabian society. So the Prophet says some, um, you know, obviously um, 
has to find a way. And um, and of course, his way is is, is through the, the top fiqh of Allah. But he uh, what what actually happens is um, something called the mu'akha. And the mu'akha is this brotherhood. Um, and, and what this is, uh, and, and, and it's very interestingly uh, referred to in, in verses in, uh, in Surah Al-Anfal, in the eighth surah, um, 62 to 63, uh, we have uh, Allah saying, um, it was he, Allah, who strengthened you with his help and with the believers and brought their hearts together. Even if you had given away everything in the earth, you could not have done this, but God brought them together. God is mighty and wise, right? So this is um, uh, something that can happen um, uh, uh, you know, from Allah's tawfiq, it can bring together um, people that are from these um, uh, you know, diverse clans and tribes. And actually, I've been um, re uh, reading something very interesting, uh, which looks at this obviously from a, from a different perspective, but uh, 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 a book by uh, Francis uh, Fukuyama uh, about the origins of political authority. And he talks about the shift between from a, a, a tribal society to a state. Uh, and one of the things he actually references, he references this uh, situation in historical terms by Islam, uh, not entirely accurately in every detail because he's not a specialist. But um, one of the things that he mentions is that one of the key things in history that has been proven able to transcend tribal boundaries is religion. And he talks about the charisma of the, the uh, prophet Muhammad and, 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 and charisma itself is a word meaning to be touched by God. Right, um, uh, I think it's a Greek word. So, um, you know, the prophets are some. You know, this his this this religious message that he brought was able to 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 break down these incredibly strong boundaries. We talked about the um, factionalism of the tribes, and you know, my tribe uh, for good or for bad, and all. You know, in the first session, I just, just discussed that. So, what was this muakha? This was one of the sort of practical elements of which this was uh, expressed, and this was um, a kind of brotherhood pact. Where, where the Muhajirun and Ansar would be teamed up, you know, one to one. Um, and there would be um, uh, a, a kind of financial and living support um, given, particularly from the Ansar, because obviously the, 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 Mecca, the, the Meccans had, um, uh, you know, left, uh, the Muhajirun had left Mecca. They didn't bring with them, you know, everything they had um, necessarily. Um, they wouldn't, you know, flocks and, and, and um, properties and all these things that they might have um land that they might own near mecca they had to leave these things this is the nature of a hijra is, is, is you you emigrate and you leave and you might leave behind what you had but you go to something better and this is why some people were um were, were hesitant to, to, to you know to, to make the hijra or they made it slowly or you know and this is a less good quality than those who were keen to to do it and so it was particularly the, the ansar you know supporting the um uh muhajirun when you know till such time that they could um uh, you know develop their own trades and particularly participate in the life of the community and what was to come um and so um uh what's really fascinating about this uh, uh waaka which is, it comes from the, the you know ahi is you know from brother you know ah and so muaka is like a brotherhood uh, pact um, that for each, uh, Allah says in the Quran in uh, Surah uh, Nisa uh, 33, translated, for each person we have made heirs to what is left by parents and close relatives, as well as those bound to your oath. So give them their share. And so this actually is understood by some commentators, by some scholars, um, as having been referred to um, an, a right to inheritance between the two uh, people uh, you know, brought together in the Mu'akha relationship um and so it was a very you know weighty thing and you might ask well you know how come i've not heard of that before well um in um in anfal again in 875 um you have um uh blood relatives are prior to others according to god's decree and this is understood as an by scholars as an abrogation of that uh, earlier ruling so what we have is a time limited um system to actually support the Muhajirun particularly and, and just mutually bring to a closeness between these two groups to transcend their, their tribal sort of bond, uh, bonds. Um, and then it was a, a later date abrogated um, uh, by, by God. And this is, you know, there's a big discussion about, you know, the nature of abrogation in the Quran, but in general, the, 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 the majority view um, is um, that, uh, you know, it, that in many cases, or in at least in 
a number of different cases and different areas of, of the rules of the Sharia that Allah at one time gives a certain ruling and at a later time um, abrogates the ruling, uh, meaning that it's then uh, no longer in, uh, in effect because of the changed circumstances within that, uh, particularly within the first period of the first community when the revelation is still fresh. And then there are various uh, debates about how this is theologically or uh, understood and so on. Um, I've written actually an article on a, uh, um, the approach of uh, Imam al-Maturidi on uh, Nasr. And it's, you know, that's um, available. Uh, I've got a, a website, it's available there, um, RamonHarvey.com, and I've got all my publications except for the books there. Uh, also academia.edu if you um, uh, use that one. So you can read about this and I go through some of these uh, questions in a bit more depth uh, if you're interested. Um, so, um, uh, you know, this is the uh, amazing kind of procedure that's put in place to, to, to bring together the community. Um, but of course, you know, there's not always a um, smooth road in these things. And so there's a story that's told that, um, you know, as a kind of sum of a nazul, a kind of uh, occasions of revelation, you know, a, a, a story that's told around why a certain verse came down, which, you know, Allahu alam, and, you know, it, it's, uh, it's in a hadith, and um, for what we know, it, it's, it's, it's uh, something that happened. Um, but, you know, there's, it's not the level of a Quranic verse and so on. But it's mentioned in the, in the tafsir of Ibn Kathir and, and it may be elsewhere as well. But it sounds that, that someone did not like this reapproachment between the two uh, clans in, in Medina. And this could be maybe one of the so-called hypocrites, the people in the community who feigns belief um, um, and but, but were not really uh, believers. Um, and... Um, so someone actually goes and um, uh, is said to have reminded the Aws and Khazraj of their battles before Islam. So it starts to sort of stir up that feeling of like, well, you know, you used to have these great battles and you were heroic and you know this and that, and you know, bringing them back to their old kind of you know their their, their, their you know their sense and these 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 habits are ingrained. And then um, you know, it said they started to chant their old slogans and then, you know go, get to their weapons. Um, you know, Aus Khazraj, and they started like you know to, they were at the point of nearly fighting, and the Prophet Sallallahu was told this was happening. He came to them, and he said, "Are you returning to Jahiliya when I'm among you?" So you know, he's, and again, this is a, as I was saying in the first session, this Jahiliya is a state. You can, you know, return to it by your actions. It's not just a time period that's now gone because the revelations come, but it's a state, and they were returning to it in their kind of uh, letting their tribal loyalties push their unity within Islam. And so the Prophet recites uh, uh, Surah 3, 103, so Ali Imran uh, 103, uh, which is, hold fast to God's rope altogether. Do not split into factions. Remember God's favor to you. You were enemies and then he brought your hearts together and you became brothers by his grace. You were about to fall into a pit of fire and he saved you from it. In this way, God makes his revelations clear to you. So that you may be rightly guided and so this is actually literally understood as being um and um, you know the, the, the angel jibreel al -Islam, uh, uh, gives this verse at this precise time uh to solve this problem and to you know help cement the community and then upon hearing this um you know the, the these people you know the, the members of the austin cosmos they start to feel ashamed um and, and they remember that this is you know they've left these kind of this kind of factionalism um, and so, um, you know, I think this is really uh, interesting to see, you know, some of these stages by which this this um, uh, uh, pattern is is found. And and to be honest, this this is a, you know, if you look at the kind of early Islamic history, you're going to see these tribal and factional elements. They don't just go away; they're strong, and they keep coming back, and they affect politics, and they affect, um, you know, the, the different groups in the early period, and you know, and they. They, they intersect in interesting ways with other kind of sex, religious sectarian elements and different beliefs and different ideas that emerge um, uh, and understandings and interpretations of, of, of revelation and so on. And so, you know, this is ever present in, you know, it's, we sometimes have this, uh, this picture that, you know, the Aus and the Khazraj, they came together and, you know, then after that, everyone is a, you know, never thinks again about their clan, maybe that, you know, because now they've got Islam. Um, it's not as simple as that. Um, these things remain. And this tendency is there and it there will be this back and forth where these kind of tribal pressures will have an effect and will, will rise up and cause conflict sometimes and cause uh, different uh, political moves and then also there will be a call towards 
go, uh, transcending this in, in, in the name of religion. And this is something, you know, that we, we said in the first session, even today, you know, you will find sometimes people putting their own particular um, group, tribe, family, whatever it is, um, ahead of, you know, what is correct according to teachings of Islam. Because uh, it's, it's a very strong pull in, in human society. And um, so it's not about, it's about sort of managing it in the best way and, and putting it in its place. That's what we said in the first session. Um, so I want to now turn to a different kind of covenant, which is a covenant that tra that goes beyond just the uh, between you know the, the the members of the believers, in the sense of the the, in the Muslim believers, to a wider community in in uh, Medina. And this is the covenant, so-called covenant of Medina, sometimes called the Constitution of Medina, um, which is a little bit inaccurate. I think uh, do we call it a, a constitution? I mean. If you mean by that the sort of a later state-based constitution, which is sometimes given, but it's, it's, it's definitely a very important document. Um, and what happened is that the Prophet Islam, um, laid out this covenant, which will bring together a, a, fr a sort of framework for the Muhajirun, the Ansar, as I've already discussed, and also some of the Jewish tribal groups, who, um, who, uh, who were the main um, uh, other group left in Medina at this point. Because what happens is that very quickly um, uh, uh, upon coming to uh, Yathrib, most of the pagan uh, members of the community, most of those who, who, who you know followed the previous Arabian religion, which is sort of idolatrous religion, uh, most of those uh, embraced uh, Islam at that time, and most of them followed the Prophet Islam. Or even if they don't truly follow the Prophet Islam, because of the um, you know uh, authority that he kind of takes on as the kind of leader of the community. They don't want to um, show their true colours, uh, and therefore they will, um, uh, you know, become this group of hypocrites. And that was a sizable group as well. But you don't get so many. You don't get very many of the um, outright kind of pre-Islamic uh, pagans still being left in the uh, city. You have a few, and they gradually, you know, after the various battles of Badr and, and, and Uhud and uh, Khandaq, they kind of die out. Uh, this, you know, die out in the sense they all end up converting um but you do have a sizable uh, group of uh, jewish clans uh, you have three famous bigger clans banu nadir banu qurayz banu qainuqa um now there is some debate over whether they were part parties to this covenant of medina or they were not and so um without going too deeply into that subject what i will say is that um uh, at the very least it's clear that there were some there were some kind of peace treaties made and non-belligerency treaties made between the prophet's community and these bigger clans so that's clear i think there's a one opinion that they were part of this um covenant but then were later taken out what we know is they're not mentioned the three big tribes of jews at the time were not mentioned in not mentioned in the, the versions of the document that we have today so whether they were taken out after various sort of events unfolded but they were there originally or they never joined but just did these kind of lesser pacts um, that's a, a, a you know matter of debate. I think um, uh, possibly the, the latter, possibly they never joined it, but wallahu alam. Um, so what is this about? Um, this gives a this covenant gives a shared political framework um, uh, for the community. It acknowledges the various tribal groups, as I've said. It acknowledges you know, the various parties, but what it does is that it, it, it puts a framework for the resolution of disputes and it puts the Prophet Muhammad in a very clear position as the kind of ultimate arbiter uh, uh, of disputes in the community. And so um, uh, in one of the statements, uh, key points of the Covenant of Medina, um, uh, it says, whatever, happen whatever happenstance or difference occurs between the parties to this agreement, such that it, ill effects are feared, it should be returned back to God, mighty and majestic, and to Muhammad, the messenger of God, may God bless, God bless blessings and peace. So you have this key role. This is the role of the Hakam, uh, the, 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 the arbitrator or even Sheikh um, uh, in, in place. And um, <clears throat> as well as this, um, there is um, um, an important, there are various provisions, we can't go through everything, but there's an important provision about um, what would happen if someone is murdered. Um, and what would happen if you recall in the pre Islamic period is there would be a kind of blood feud. And this could be a case where you would just start to kill the, 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 the person whose family member is killed would go and kill any member 
of the other tribe. Um, and um, this would be acceptable. And then, you know, they, you know, basically start, you could often start a big war or start back and forth retaliations on either side. Um, and um, what um, uh, it says in the covenant is the, the one for whom there is clear proof that he has murdered a believer arbitrarily shall be slain in retaliation unless the kin of the deceased are appeased with blood money. This is a, you know, there's a, with the kisas that, you know, with the, um, if someone is, is murdered, then someone else is murdered. Uh, someone else is, is executed, you know, legally executed in, in, in turn in that system, unless there's a payment of blood money. Now, the point here, um, it, and it says, sorry for carrying on, all the believers are to be against him without exception. It's not permissible for them to fail to stand against him. So before what would happen is everyone would divide onto their own tribes and you, would, you wouldn't stand, um, you wouldn't say someone, a member of, of one's own tribe had done the murdering. One would not work to apprehend that person from one's own tribe that did the wrong thing. There would be no justice in that sense. But what would happen, what happens with the constitution uh, or sorry, the, the covenant of Medina now is that it doesn't matter whose tribe they're from, they have murdered a believer, that person and not anyone else. But that particular person who did the wrong wrong will now be held responsible and they will be executed or there will be a, um, a, a appeasement through the blood money. So this is a very important shift in the status of rule of law, in um, the idea of personal accountability for wrong and, um, uh, you know, and, and, and a sense that the believers um, as a community form a body that it goes beyond their tribal elements and if you look go to the quran now if we go to um uh 2178 uh Baqarah 178 oh you who believe fair retribution is prescribed for you in cases of murder the free man for the free man the slave for the slave the female for the female now there is a de debate in the um in the in the scholarly interpretation and literature and the, and the schools of fiqh about you know how do we understand these statements now i uh, prefer this understanding that's found in the Hanafi school, but it's um, you know found elsewhere, I'm sure as well. But particularly in you know, the Hanafi school is where I've um, read up, read up on this. Um, that this is um, uh, this is not to be understood as that you know uh, if a man kills a, a woman, then then there's no kasas uh, and so on. But this is just a, a, a way of putting the point. You know, man for a man, slave for a slave, female for female, literally. You know, whoever um, is um, is uh, whoever is slain, then their sl then their person who slain them should be killed, whatever status they're from. Um, and so, you know, this is um, a legitimate uh, opinion um, in the uh, in the in Quranic interpretation and in the schools of, of fiqh. Um, but the, but our point here is that this is now it's becoming a very precise uh, 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 instrument that you know you don't just take someone from the tribe you have to take the, the person who has done the wrong um uh, and um um uh, you actually also um you see that this actually extends beyond just the um uh, the believers you also get uh, a connection in the covenant um uh, to actually the rights of the the jews as well who joined in this um uh, covenant and, and, and were part of it. It says in, 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 in the, the text of the covenant, the Jews who join us as clients um, will receive aid and equal rights. They will not be wronged, nor will their enemies be aided against them. So this is um, um, uh, what we see in this situation is those who had joined into, joined the pact, joined this kind of ummah. And it actually says that these are, this is one ummah, right? So this is an ummah in the sense of the, the ummah of, of, of the Covenant of Medina, um, that actually um, uh, these same kind of um, uh, uh, rules for um, uh, murder in the community will also apply uh, in their case as well. Uh, so it's not just for the, the Muslims at that time, it also extends to the uh, uh, those Jews uh, who joined the, um, the tribes who joined the uh, Covenant. So, uh, and a second element also that's given to, um, as part of this uh, Covenant is actually defense of the city that the Muslims who have joined it and also the Jews who have joined it, they actually have to um, support financially 
paying for the, the defense of, the, of uh, Medina, making sure that it's not attacked. Um, and so this is also a part of the provision. Um, and then, um, you know, as I've been doing, I'm kind of sort of interweaving these elements of uh, uh, the covenant of Medina with the um, Quran. You also have, um, along with this defense uh, of Medina, there is also a, a formal permission given within the Quran to take up arms, because of course, as I mentioned, the, the uh, Muslims were not really able, they were not able to organize into armies fight in Mecca. They were, they were told to be patient. They were told to, 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 to emigrate if needed, if need be and so on. But in, um, uh, um, so in um, Surah, um, uh, in the 22nd Surah, verses 39 to 40, and which is revealed soon after the Hijra, you have um, uh, the statement, those who have been attacked are permitted to take up arm, ar arms because they have been wronged. God has the power to help them. Those who have been driven unjustly from their homes only for saying our Lord is God. If God did not repel some people by means of others, many monasteries, churches, synagogues, and mosques where God's name is much invoked would have been destroyed. God is sure to help those who help his cause. God is strong and mighty. So you see here this, um, you know, the um, who is who have been driven unjustly from their homes. This is the Muhajirun. Now they are given um, permission, along with the Ansar and along with those who work with them in the Covenant of Medina, to take up arms um, when they have been attacked you know, to, in, a, in a defense um, because of their, you know, this uh, uh, unjust um, element. And also the point is made that if this was not to be done, then many, and it includes synagogues. You know, Jewish places were includes church and monasteries as well, but synagogues and mosques so would would have um, would have been destroyed. So here we have, um, you know, this 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 defense of Medina includes defending the synagogues of Medina, includes defending the, um, uh, uh, the you know the, the mosques that have been established and so on. Now, in the as the history unfolds, of course, um, you know, and we're not going to go too much into it. There are various events. That end up in 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 conflict emerging between um, the major Jewish tribes and the the Muslims in in Medina. Um, these three major tribes we discussed uh, briefly: uh, Banu Qurayza, Nadia, and Qainuqa. They end up, you know, either you know uh, having kind of um, uh, being uh, expelled in some cases, being punished in other cases, and so on. Um, and there's various reasons for this, which are which are a, which are a complex discussion in themselves uh, and can be studied as part of the Sira or you know. If you there's there's details of some of these things in my book, in the Quran and the Just Society, um, you can read more about those the details of those uh, events. But the principles here are, are very clear in the early Medina Medina period. Even if actually the way that things happen in reality did not fully allow uh, uh, this uh, you know this, this this shared community to kind of emerge in the fullest sense um, later on, and there's, there there are these conflicts to come. Um, the, the the kind of the last thing I want to um, touch on today as part of the um, uh, main kind of uh, content that I'm going to be delivering is, um, oh, sorry, before the lessons for today is the markets and fair trading. And what's really interesting, um, again, um, uh, in this time is, is this when you if, you, if you dig a bit deeper into the Hijra, and it sometimes requires kind of quite subtle investigations um, into kind of the historical reports and the narratives that we have. You can sort of get a sense of of where the markets were located and how this reflects kind of the, the society of, of Yathrib at the time. Um, and um, what we find from the sources is that two of the markets were controlled by Jewish tribes. Um, is before the Hijra. Two were controlled by Jewish tribes. The most central was the market of Banu Qaynuqa. Um, and, and this was the most significant market. And then the other two were... Um, Controlled by pagans, so by you know the 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 the, the pre-Islamic you know Arabian tribes, and um, one of these ones controlled by the pagans was known as Al uh, Safasif, and this was um, near the area of Kuba, and it was owned by Banu Jahjaba, and they were amongst the clans of Banu Amr ibn Auf, right, and that was one of the Aufs. So the main thing, there's a lot of names there. Uh, it's good to have them in the recording, of course. But um, the main thing to note here is that this is an Aus market, right? And then um, there was another market 
um, which is a which is a market called uh, Mulvahim, and Mulvahim um, was very very close to the Prophet's mosque, and this was um, uh, you know because we understand that the Prophet's mosque was built on the land of the Banu Banu Najjar from the Khazraj, it seems to me this could have been a Khazraji market, which would make sense to kind of counterbalance the Aus market. So this is my uh, a, a speculation which I suggest in my book. But in any case, the Prophet Sallallahu when he comes to Medina, he establishes a market. And one of the things that he does is he says that there'll be no taxation in his market. Right? And what we can understand from this is that there were some high taxes, i.e. people were taxed to be able to operate the markets. Um, um, you know, and the Prophet Sallallahu didn't do not allow this. He wanted to allow there to be a very open and uh, fair trade, so it could not be sort of the, the practice of using the market could not be monopol not monopolized at the time. And then um, uh, we, there's also an element to the Prophet uh, market, which um, is that no one can kind of um, uh, keep their place. So if someone goes and spreads out their goods, I mean, imagine a market is just really a place for transactions. It's not, uh, it's not got much of necessary buildings to it. But um, if someone spreads out their um, you know, I know a cloak and they put some goods to sale or, or sets up a store, a temporary store or something. Um, and then they want to go away for some reason. They can't like leave their things and say, well, no one else can use this. So basically, it becomes that space then becomes available for anyone else. And so this is, again, to keep it very free and available for any, just as a space for transaction between people. And this is what the process of wanted. Um, obviously, you know, we're in a very different economic and you know, social situation than, than at that time but the principles i think are clear um and then um what we find um in terms of we talked um, before about some of the elements of uh you know giving uh good measure and not be, uh, acting in an unjust way in, 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 re in relation to wealth um but um you actually have this um uh, uh a surah uh, that specifically deals with this question which is surah al mutafifin which is you know in the last uh, sections of the Quran and it begins those woe to those who give short measure who demand about I mean, short, short measure is to like you know either put you know someone's put the thumb down on the um, scale or trick the scale or give less than should you should give from the scale so either uh, you know taking more money or giving normally giving less goods um, so woe to those who give short measure who demand of others other people full measure for themselves but give less than they should when it is they who weigh or measure for others. And what's very interesting is that there's different opinions about when this verse was revealed, or when these, this surah was revealed. And the one opinion is it was revealed in, in Mecca. But another opinion is it was revealed on the way from, Medina to, from Mecca to Medina. So literally um, uh, uh, in, on the Hijra. And then finally, um, there's an opinion that it was the first surah revealed in Medina and possibly even within the first hour, it said. So what's really interesting about these reports is that it's this idea that one of the first things the Prophet Sallallahu did when he came to Medina was to set up this market to make sure that it was fair and that one of the things that precipitating this was, of course, these ver verses of the Quran. Um, and, um, you know, this is, uh, uh, you know, if we look at the kind of structure of what I've been talking about, um, we've, I've been talking about the qualities of, you know, the, the, the pledge that allowed the community of believers to come together despite tribal differences. The covenant that allows the, that community of believers to interact in a just way with other religious representatives within the, their, their context of Medina. The, the, the rules and the, the covenants and the, and the uh, permission in, in Revelation that allows that shared Ummah of Medina, of the covenant, to protect themselves from harm and to manage internal strife and murder and so on, which, which is the most, obviously the most serious of kind of crimes within the city. And then um, what is the, 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 the um, conditions that have been set for allowing there to be uh, you know, fair trade and economic uh, sharing and, and, and um, you know, not so sort of sharing, but you know, exchange between the different members of, of the community and setting up a kind of alternative market without high taxes 
to enable kind of a, a flourishing and maybe a more just practice of of um, uh, you know trade and what's what was going on at the time. So you know I think I think this sort of sets us up to understand you know the the nature of the you know Medina that the Prophet is 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 shaping, um, and then um, it will set us up for next time to look at how this then develops as um, we could say more of the Sharia is revealed in the Medina period. So the lessons for today, um, uh, I would like to just point out a few, you know, kind of thoughts, uh, 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 comments for you um, to reflect on and maybe bring some of this information into your own reality, into your own uh, life um, and uh, mine as well. Um, so the first thing is that what can we see about the, the, the Ansar here? The Ansar, they saw an opportunity. They saw the opportunity to bring prophecy into their lives and into the community. They went to, you know, to, to uh, you know, to considerable effort to travel to Aqaba to call the prophet to to join them to take the pledge to, um, you know, obviously to accept his message. But they had a, a a chance to, you know, they had political intentions, but they ended up with a, um, uh, you know, with this great light of prophecy coming into their lives. So how can we? think about the opportunities we have to bring prophecy into our lives, the communities. And here we have, um, you know, uh, you know, we have things like the, the Cambridge Muslim College, which is, you know, bringing, you know, knowledge and, um, you know, bringing together scholars, teaching knowledge and doing a, a lot of this kind of work. So again, this, I think this is a re this is one opportunity. There's many others we have as well. What can we do? Do we, do we have any circles that we attend? Do we run our own circles? What about for our families? Do we um, sit with our children and talk to them about these uh, about stories of prophets, about Islam, and so on and so forth? Um, and then next, um, uh, there's a highlight here in today's session on the importance of covenants and agreements, including uh, shared action between those from different backgrounds or religious communities. This is ultimately about being true to our word. How can we be true to our word? How how can people trust our word? We have to stick to it. We have to. Uh, be an honest person, upright person who fulfills their promises. And this is what the Prophet Sallallahu he fulfilled his promise. You know, when he made the promise, they pledged to him, he came and he fulfilled, they fulfilled their promise, the Ansara, in terms of, um, you know, joining the community, um, taking all those instructions from the Prophet of, of the moral qualities and then ultimately protecting him in the second pledge. But then um, he fulfilled, the Prophet came to their town to their city and he transformed it and so he fulfilled his promise and so this is um uh really be, the, the idea that you know our, our there's a saying that the uh, you know the word is our word is our bond right um if if um if if you know someone's kind of word is you know and credibility of their saying you know what they say being true is one of the most important things we have um and so it's something we should never give up um, um, and we should we should not uh, give it up lightly, and we should um, strive not to give it up at all in any way. Um, uh, and this is you know this is one of the things we're seeing today. Um, it just strikes me when we look at the kind of politicians that we've had recently. And I mentioned this before, but it's, it's worth reflecting on when you look at politicians in in, uh, in the UK. You know, at the moment we've got someone like Boris Johnson uh, in in America. Until very recently, they had Donald Trump. These are people who not just are not taken uh, their word that their, their 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 word is not taken as true it's just well known that the one they cannot be trusted and that what they say is is just you know patently false and uh, particularly in, in the uk where we have uh, uh, johnson um uh, you know and this is not like a, a, a matter of uh, you know this is a matter of common knowledge um in, you know i guess in ramadan it's not it's sort of so always so good to speak about the person in, in person but i think given someone is literally the the prime minister um and it's just known for not for not you know keeping to what is being said and actually you know following uh, uh you know agreeing with the last person to speak to and so on and so forth and what's this and the reason to say this is it's resulting in these terrible problems in the country you know with this uh, you know very bad response to the coronavirus you know all these kind of problems that we've had in the last few years and just no credibility for going forward in terms of, you know, if we don't know that things will get worse again. So we pray to Allah for support and help in these times and to, um, uh, uh, you know, give us the best and uh, allow us to be people of, tr of trustworthiness uh, and, tr and truthfulness. Um, 
uh, and not to be sort of shameless and uh, not more stand. Um, and then um, uh, what is this ability to be truthful or trustworthy is ultimately a blessing from Allah. Um, it's something that's come from, from Allah. Um, in, and it's ultimately a top fiat that's, that's granted by Allah, so we have to ask for them to help with that. Uh, and then when we look at the um, uh, uh, the real this idea of the justice for the murdered person, this is a, a kind of re resolution uh, uh, coming from this period of jahiliya, which I you know I contrasted it with it. Um, that there was this kind of um, just this open slaughter and open um, uh, you know retaliation, and then there is. Um, uh, this, this, the coming of, of justice um, in the sense of very clear one-to-one um, -one justice. So how can we, um, uh, how can we um, seek to be people of justice? How can we make sure that we will um, not be you know, partisan to a certain uh, group or certain opinion? But if someone has done wrong, we have to call it out. We have to stand on the right side. And this can come in all sorts of contexts in our own lives, standing up for the right enough in, in family situations, in family conflicts sometimes. And you have to be sensitive in these things. But ultimately, to make a stand for the good is what a lot wants. Um, and also in the wider sense of uh, in our communities and in, in, in some of the abuses that happen in the communities, just to stand, stand for what's right. Um, and then um, the commitment uh, uh, about markets being fair. Um, yeah, um, this um, the idea of taxation. Uh, uh, you know, the kind of taxation uh, in the sense of um, for the good of society. But this is about taxation for just for transacting. So this is different from for, you know, in in the, as we're going to come to next time. There is this uh, the concept of zakah in the community. Um, you know, in the Sharia, uh, and which is the kind of uh, taken. That has to be taken from everyone has to, you have to be paid and then it's used for social good and obviously in, in in our present time and in our societies there's various types of tax that go to the state or go to the government that are used for good for example funding hospitals and other sorts of need no problem at all with that but what we're talking about here is taxes just for transacting which will benefit those who run the markets right and this is um, a, a problematic situation um you know uh, we can say we can sort of look at this in as an as a as a you know in terms of ethical principles as a kind of parallel to the ideas of kind of corporate greed uh, uh, and monopolizing that we have today, um, and these can be very harmful things. So how can we seek to have more equitable sharing of goods this, and not just monopolization by um, you know major players doing everything? Um, and so this could be something to really look at and seek alternatives from some of the means of trading which we, we're becoming very accustomed to um and um uh just finally to finish off before q a and so on um the city you know city as is, is a great philosophical theme as well um so as well as being you know something we've come across here in the sira mentioned in relation to uh, our discussion of quranic verses it's also something mentioned in, in the philosophical tradition particularly in plato's republic uh, but also uh, mentioned by Aristotle and in the Islamic uh, field of, sort of Islamic uh, philosophy or Muslim philosophers, figures such as Al-Farabi talks about the Medina um, uh, and, and its qualities. And, and one of the great things about the city is it can act as a kind of metaphor, you know, for actually the individual person or the heart or even soul. Um, and so, you know, we don't need to push the, the, these elements uh, too far. Just to give an indication, um, as well as talking about like how in our communities can we be peaceful and and uh, act for good, are we internally at peace? Are we internally uh, nurturing our state of uh, you know good you know internal um, uh, 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 harmony? So we're not just in conflict with different ideas, different whims and desires pushing each way, but acting for the greater good of, you know of our total health and welfare um are we defending our heart from the whispers of the shaitan uh, are we defending uh, uh our, ourselves from the harms uh, potentially coming to us um you know and you know how are we you know what sort of um you know transactions are we making 
you know we could say um, perhaps even in terms of like you know what are we what are we buying and what are we uh, what price are we paying for the things that we do things that we take on you know are we selling ourselves uh, sometimes so there's different ways we can think about these things but um, there's very powerful metaphors there and it's actually something also mentioned uh, by by the scholars scholars in the uh, spiritual tradition different elements and you know so it's, it's worth reflecting on you know how can we make an analogy to our own selves as in some ways uh, a, a city that has to be in a, in a good state to flourish um, so I think we'll, we'll stop there for, for now in terms of my own delivery of content um, as before there's a few things to say so one is um, if you've got questions uh, to, to sort of ask you can um, there should be a link in the chat it should be very clear just go in, fill it in, make sure you put it for this class, Transcending the Tribes, and I will hopefully be able to pull that up on a document just presently, uh, and I will try to answer the questions as I can. Um, secondly, um, uh, you know, just to say, um, you know, this is obviously with, uh, in, in collaboration and, you know, for, you know, with uh, Cambridge Muslim College, um, you know, it's been, it's a really good uh, campaign we're with, with doing here with the Sow a Seed campaign, please get involved as you can. At the end of the q a i'll be saying a few more things about that um so you know do support the college and we'll come back to that point um and so uh inshallah um let me have a look um uh alhamdulillah jazakallah khairan uh, who said uh fulcrum said many so many nuggets of knowledge here and there um uh yeah well i try i mean some of this is from the the book i'm going to plug the book quickly here uh, this is uh, the Quran uh, and Just Society. I mean, it's available for about twenty pounds. It's twenty five. The official price is twenty five, uh, twenty four nine nine. But I think you can normally get for about even seventeen to twenty pounds, depending on the different deals that are available, different discounts. But do have a uh, check this out if you're interested in some of what I'm saying. I mean, it's, you really can. There's a lot more depth. There's, there's references. You know, if you want to study this, it could go really well with studying the Quran and so on. Um, uh, I should lift it higher. I mean, we can't see that. Just do that. See this, uh, uh, society. Uh, check it out. Um, uh, alhamdulillah. Um, uh, and actually, we got the cover for the, the my new book. Actually, um, recently, if you go to my Twitter, you can see it. I put it up today. Um, uh, so yeah, so Tuesday, 27th. Okay, some questions. So we're we'll going through these questions, inshallah. Bismillah. Um, what is the difference between the transcendence of these tribes versus disintegration? Specifically, why did Islam as a religion not seek the dissolution of tribal culture? So it's a fantastic question. Um, so um, it's very interesting to think about this. Um, what, you know, and I will just give my uh, you know immediate reactions to that because uh, that is a you know a, could be a serious research question to sort of look at more deeply into. That. I'm sure there has been work done. My sense and my uh, study so far it leads me to think that um there's a recognition that it was not possible although the, the the tribes could be brought together into a single umma single state to seek to utterly um wipe out the 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 tribal you know elements was not practical given you know they, they, were, they were going from a completely tribal society to forming a kind of a new type of religiously constituted society, literally in a generation, um, and that to, to, the, the, there is a you know there is a we can say there is a wisdom in allowing there still to be these tribal expressions, um, you know, but having it within a larger uh, structure. Um, there's a there's a there's a wisdom to this that, that allows uh, success basically. That this 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 project and we can see the success that these um and it's actually very interesting even when um the the muslims and they when they we, we're focusing only on the period of medina uh Sira. but when the muslim community goes out to these different places and the conquests happen so-called conquests uh to to kufa to to bastara to and so on they actually set up these um kind of garrison towns and they are literally organized in tribal districts so it it there is this kind of um you know there is still these different parts within the whole of islam in this early period and what happens and, and obviously different groups have remain important for generations 
Um, and even later on, you get various different family-based groups taking hold uh, of, you know, of, um, uh, uh, you know, of, you know, of, of power in, in Islam. It's, it, you know, when the Abbasids come in, they're a different family with a different lineage. They trace themselves back to um, Abbas, the um, uh, Prophet Sassam's uncle. Um, and so it's, it's just, a, you know, rather than the Banu Umayya. And so it's still, in a sense, a tribal situation. And really, if you look at the world, you know, it's only, I mean, we, we, you know, in, in, in Europe, there was a certain shift and there's complex reasons. And I think some of the book I mentioned before by Fukuyama mentioned, talks about this. Um, there's complex reasons historically why a kind of tribal culture was removed in, in Europe over time. But, um, you know, for for um uh you know in most of the world you know it, it, it's, it remains a very important element of life in some form you know in, in modernity maybe less so but for many generations many years many centuries it wasn't something easily removed and so we can say that uh, perhaps that the divine wisdom is to work within it provide islam to be fully realized within it and then if at a later date people remove the tribe because there's no there's very little explicit reference to tribal elements in in uh, the sharia you know if you go through the quran the rules do not relate to that so much you might find some odd cases where there's, there's certain things relate to tribes tribal elements but very very little in the, in the actual kind of um, elements of the religion so that when a society is ready to in a sense completely leave that or that is to happen islam can still exist fully um so i think that this is it's it's really the case that islam just doesn't it doesn't force uh, a, a non-tribal organization but it gives a system of principles of of um, morality and of uh, law that can be applied within or without that's what i would say uh, wallahu alam um from a societal perspective how does islam affect the tribal interpretation of life and wealth um um, let me never think. Um, okay, so let's go with um, life. I mean, I think many of these points I've already uh, kind of touched on, but um, thinking about life, um, the tribal understanding of life, on the one hand, um, see, I'm not, I'm not sure if this is what's being asked, but I'm trying to answer the question as I see it. Um, life refers to, um, you know, one's life, um, and it can refer to the ultimate aspect of life so that before islam the arabians would, would be fairly materialistic they would think that this life is pretty much it you know we live and we die and this this kind of thing is is, is cited in in the uh, you know in the in the quran that they did not believe in the sort of hereafter and so it changes uh, the idea of life is not just something that's happening and then it's going to be gone and therefore make the most of it um in the sense of we seek pleasure but that life has a purpose and the purpose is for this goal of the hereafter and therefore it should be used in a certain way according to what God wants in terms of the test that we're being given. So this is one important factor. And then, um, and so I guess that's, so, so in a societal level, what would that mean? It would mean a kind of more, um, you know, a, a more pious, you know, a society that has a certain types of uh, practices of prayer, of charity, certain things that would basically um, be done for the sake of sacrifices for the sake of God um, would become more prevalent in the society. Um, wealth wise, um, you know, I want to come on to that a bit more next week, but basically there is this um, this development. Before there was this idea of kind of like generosity, that, uh, you know, a, a tribal chief would be generous and slaughter, you know, 16 camels and feed everyone and then they'll be in sort of indebted to that person the the the, the, the islam doesn't get a, again doesn't just destroy the idea of kind of uh, you know good hosting and generosity of course not but there is these kind of minimum standards of zakat that those who have have wealth don't have the choice to hoard it that they have to give back and that they have the wealth has to kind of circulate around the community and around society but i want to touch on that more next time um Third, what commentary can you offer about the possibility of a prosperity gospel that seeks to m m movement in Muslim communities? I don't know what that means, um, so I think it's probably better not to answer it. Uh, so maybe um, if the 
uh, person who's asked the question could next time perhaps uh, re put the question again, maybe in a different way. So I'm not sure what um, a prosperity gospel means. So I don't want to just make up an interpretation of what that means. Maybe they're referring to, maybe they can explain what they're referring to in a little, or you can explain what you're referring to in a little bit more detail. And then I can kind of understand what you mean by this idea of prosperity gospel. And then I can comment on uh, uh, what that means. Because at the, at the moment, I'm a bit lost of what that refers to. Uh, four, do you have any recommendations for both Muslim academic papers and general reading material on what had been discussed? Been discussed? Well, I mean, I've, I've massively plugged my book already. Um, uh, but um, uh, um, in terms of these kind of issues, um, uh, Let's see. Um, so, I mean, I would say it depends on what level of study. Obviously, um, I would say that the um, my book is very good for some of these questions. Um, if you you know the Sierra books, you can read and sort of with this mind have a have a look at those kind of things. Some of what I've discussed is this, uh, if you're in a, into a more academic, um, if you're interested in a more academic treatment, there is a. Um, there are various uh, papers and, and, and articles by um, uh, a scholar called uh, Michael Lecker, who's not a Muslim scholar, um, but he discusses things like the markets, the tribes, um, the covenant of Medina. He has a book on that. So you can kind of go in a bit deeper uh, on some of his works. And he had a teacher called uh, uh, MJ Kister, who also has similar kind of dis discussions and articles, which are, I think, mainly available online. M much of this can, can be found on their websites online. As with many academic works, they can be found. But, um, you know, you can look that up. But the references, again, in my book, there's references to these authors. So you can kind of find the references to, you know, I allude to things. I mean, um, other writers, um, I think there's a writer, I think it's um, a scholar called uh, Mahmoud Ibrahim. I'm also going to look this up so close. Um, yeah, Mahmoud Ibrahim's got a book called Merchant Capital and Islam. Um, that's kind of an interesting book and in, in these kind of questions. Um, there's other works, um, you know, that relate. There's different perspectives that can be taken, but there are various um, uh, works. I would say, um, you know, if you look in, in, my, in, if you do get my book and as a starting point, it would give you the bibliography to look at the other kinds of works and where you could pursue these questions. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know if. Um, maybe I'm missing something, but um, I'm sure there are books that discuss some of these issues. Um, as I said previously, Mon uh, William Montgomery Watt, uh, again, a non-Muslim author, um, but he um, has his Muhammad at Mecca, Muhammad at Medina. Very good discussion of these kind of social and economic questions. I draw on his work uh, a fair bit in what I'm doing and what I did in the book. Um, so, you know, you can kind of uh, find elements but to kind of put it all together and to speak in this kind of moral terms and the development of morality quite as I'm doing is I think a fairly you know novel approach in some respects and so therefore I'm more familiar with the way I've tried to do it in my book than I'm I've taken different elements facts interpretations discussions from various places but I've kind of tried to weave it together into this different kind of narrative now the way I do it in the book is I discussed by theme so i go through um uh, politics uh, and i go through to war and peace and uh, arms and marriage and inheritance and you know, i look at all these different themes what i'm doing in but within each theme i give the uh, uh, development through time right i give the you know this is how it, i mean i I put most of the pre-Islamic stuff in, in one chapter on history. And then I do the other developments from Mecca, early Medina, late Medina, you know, and I go through each one in turn because that works for what I was trying to do in that project. But for this series of lectures, what I've done is take some of the same material um, and, and others as well, other material as well, and then rearranged it more chronologically to give you a sense of the shift of through time, which I think is kind of more coherent for what I want to do in these four sessions. Um, and what was really interesting is like today, some of this material on the Covenant, Covenant of Medina, it didn't make it into the book. Um, uh, but what um, you know happened is, is a part of my pre, pre research along the way when I was doing my PhD. Um, you know, uh, I kept those files and I was able to sort of access them and bring out those points for for our notes today. So, inshallah, um, uh, I hope you found the session uh, useful. Just before we uh, finish. Um, 
uh, I want to mention a couple of things to you. Um, first of all, um, uh, the Cambridge Muslim College is doing something called Seed Stories. This the link should be uh, in the chat. But basically, um, you know, as part of the campaign of sow a seed um, and you know seeking change, um, you know, in the community, but also individually, uh, you know, the, the Cambridge Muslim College is looking for your stories of um, you know how you may have taken on a new habit or a new practice or just something inspiring that's you know you're trying to do from starting from Ramadan. And so what there, there's full details in the uh, uh, in the link. Basically, it would be sort of making a, a short video, which would then be uh, published in a certain way by supported by the Cambridge Muslim College to be published as part of their uh, you know offering and you know as a to be you know a part of a I guess short videos that will be put on the YouTube or or the website. And um, the second thing I want to mention. Um, so if you're interested in the seed stories, the first thing is if you're interested in the seed stories, uh, it's that idea. If you've got something you want to share. Uh, please follow the link and get in touch uh, with the team. With, the second thing is the feedback form. Uh, there'll be some link for a feedback form. I guess, what do you like about what I'm doing, <laughs> what we're doing on, on in this uh, uh, program, um, and what could be different, what could be better, what could you know change to be, be kind. Um, and uh, the last thing is um, th there's a video that's launching, uh, which is uh, what we can't do without your help. So it's kind of a you know, check this out. It's kind of like, I guess, highlighting the the, the college's um, uh, uh, reliance on supporters to, to do good things. So check out the video, uh, what we can't do. Um, and so finally, please, um, we're going into the uh, final uh, 10 days now, uh, very soon. Uh, this is the time when people, you know, really want to uh, give a bit, uh, you know, uh, seeking Allah's pleasure, seeking Layla um, uh, seeking Baraka, and, uh, and maybe you know giving out from giving out what you can uh, and next year, next session i'll be talking more about the zakah and sadaqah and so on but just even from now please um support the college um uh you know i've said a lot before i'll say it again um it's an amazing institution we have very few institutions like this i was on a um uh, 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 I did a, something yesterday, which you can find, uh, or if you go through my Twitter, you'll find it, but I did a talk about Kalam Jadid, which was my kind of renewed theology. Um, uh, so I was doing some theological discussion and it was with um, scholars mainly from Turkey who were hosting it. And um, one of the things I was saying is that, you know, it's very hard to write theological works in, you know, constructive theological works in institutions in, in, in you know, in the universities in the UK and US in the West, because there's a focus maybe that Islam is seen as a, a study of history, a study of society, but not uh, law, but not maybe a, a study of, uh, you know, something that's uh, engaged with as a theologian. And I said that one of the re reasons I've been able to write work in this field is because I've been able to be uh, based at a small uh, uh, Islamic college. And I talked about the Cambridge Muslim College and also about Ibrahim College as well. And um, uh, I just think that the, the you know the work that uh, the Cambridge Muslim College does is fantastic, and it gives a space for doing the kind of work, Islamically focused work, but rigorous in terms of you know incredible academic work as well. It's a unique mix, having the kind of traditional grounding, having the um, academic uh, rigor and and engagement, uh, and be able to bring that together and to to train students and to um, host academics host research projects um host you know uh, good works of you know all types and ultimately you know make a difference in what people are thinking what people are reading and you know in the wider society so um you know support the college please um do what you can uh, and so a seed um so inshallah uh jazakallah khairan uh, uh, see you next week inshallah assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah